form like this. Before I begin, I'd like to just mention two things or a few notions. Um, this is a condensed draft version of a previously written paper, uh, so some elements of it may seem like we're skipping over large segments of individual corpuses, um, but that's the nature of, of these presentations. And secondly, uh, this paper is uh, duly inspired by what I like to say the two hands of uh, Bob's. Uh, one, one of my uh, teachers here in Toronto, Bob Sweetman, uh, who gave much structure to this paper, and in many ways, the implicit hand of Bob Doran um, further on as this project uh, goes into future iterations. You'll notice that Bob or Doran's hand is a little bit more implicit rather than explicit here, but uh, hopefully it bears some fruit for further discussion afterwards. So I begin. In his monograph entitled Divine Scripture and Human Understanding, a Systematic Theology of the Christian Bible, Joseph Gordon, who we heard from yesterday, writes, it is impossible, in fact, to take a good look at the Bible to simply see what it says about itself. All engagement with the textual otherness of Scripture depends upon the subjective constitution of the individuals or communities engaging those remarks. Casual use of the common catchphrase, the Bible says, can easily hide from hearers and readers a myriad of assumptions about the nature and function of divine authority, which are inadequate as understandings of how God has actually providentially brought about and used scripture in human history, end quote. Scriptural exegesis has been and presently remains one of the most important and contentious practices in Christian living. How individuals and communities read scripture has influenced the interpretation of the Bible in an enormous manner of ways. These countless methods of interpreting the Bible have caused and only for further perpetuate denominational divisions within the universal Christian church. The divisions have given rise to a perception that the truths of the Bible have become fragmented as a result to the multiple interpretive lenses used to adjudicate their meaning. Gordon details, perspectives that promote the idea that texts speak only through one interpretive lens tend to veil the plethora of assumptions we as readers bring to these texts. In the case of the Bible, such a position hides our assumptions about how divine authority is communicated and received by its human subjects. A text, an individual or communal adjudicated authority, determines the capacity for which that text is persuasive or enlightening to its audience. This raises the question, does authority, which is an indicator of a text's persuasive ability, come on, uh, come behalf of the speaker slash historical circumstances that gave rise to the text, or does a text authority emerge in the reception to an individual or community? Is the Bible authoritative and persuasive because of the collective authority of the biblical writers, which taken into account the many that many Christians hold in faith that the Bible is divinely inspired, or because the community who in faith read the words of the Bible then prescribe meaning and value onto the text? Depending on how we answer that question, does it illuminate something insightful about what the term the Bible says is really attempting to communicate? In his essay entitled The Dialectic of Authority, Bernard Lonergan details that, quote, authority is legitimate power, and that legitimate power is a product of cooperation, end quote. The communal practice of expressing particular narratives, interpretations, and meanings is one of the ways Lonergan identifies the authority of a community. Yet when referencing the Bible, many Christian readers struggle with the apparent tension between Scripture's divine origins as the word of God and the human act of interpretation. And said, as Gordon alludes to throughout his monograph, many readers of the Bible approach the text as a static body of authoritative knowledge. However, in, the witnessing, in witnessing the vast varieties of biblical interpretations along denominational lines alone, we recognize this not to be the case. Therefore, in this presentation, I'd like to plant some initial seeds of thought for how we can go about understanding biblical authority as both spoken by the highest of authorities through divine inspiration and as actively given its persuasive power and, and meaning on the part of human re reception. In other words, does the authority of a text emerge from the establishment of a credible speaker or from the reception from its audience? This presentation will introduce notions of rhetorical theory to begin to unpack these questions. In examining how the inter internal rhetorical triadic relationship of ethos, logos, and pathos goes through a process of alteration in the movement from oral to written text in the West, I will explain or exemplify more rather how we may begin to ponder the, about the origins of scriptural authority. In order to set tight parameters on myself, I will limit the analysis of rhetorical theory 
to the writings of Plato and St. Augustine for the time being. So Plato and the ancient rhetorical context in which he emerges out of. Rhetoric has been conceptualized in a variety of ways by various thinkers in Western canon. Isocrates in the Antidosis, for instance, depicts rhetoric as a skill for the invention and collation of topics in order to speak truth in conversation. He distinguishes between three distinct modes of speech, deliberative, epideictic, and judicial contexts. The deliberative mode is the communication of truth in public discourse and typically manifests itself in political dialogue of governments and policymaking. It is inherently persuasive as it attempts to convince an individual towards the right course of action. Epideictic rhetoric seeks to ascribe praise or blame using language, while the category of judicial rhetoric attempts to bring meaning to our questions of just actions. All three correlate to one another in temporal sequencing. Judicial rhetoric is concerned with events of the past and the evaluation as to the morality of those past actions. Epideictic is related to the praise or blame of an individual or community's present actions. And deliberative rhetoric is concerned with the persuasion of the individual or community towards certain future actions. All three, when properly conceived, should serve for the communication of truth in their unique forms of expression. However, as Isocrates illustrates in his polemic against the sophists, quote, but is it not these sophists alone who are open to criticism, but also those who profess to teach political discourse? For the latter have no interest whatever in the truth, but consider that they are masters of an art if they can attract a great number of students by the smallest of their charges and the magnitude of their professions and get something out of them, end quote. Isocrates, Isocrates seems to be addressing in his retort to the sophists an apparent disconnect between rhetoric employed by an orator and the truth of the subject matter at hand. He critiques the sophists for using the skills of rhetoric to not only speak falsities, as this becomes Isocrates' main theme in the Antidosis, but to deceptively persuade their students and audiences into believing these falsities. Under an Isocratean perspective, the nature of rhetoric is for the communication of the truth in either a deliberative, epideictic, or judicial mode. Hence, a perversion of rhetoric for the production of and the persuasion to falsity exemplifies an additional component in rhetorical practice that must reside external to its very nature. This means that rhetoric cannot be entirely accounted for under a rubric of an empirical method. Empirical methods, like the post-Cartesian scientific method, prescribes a model whereby when defined variables are recreated, particular truths may be exemplified. The term method, when traditionally conceptualized, in, in contrast to, as many of us know, maybe a more Lonergarian inspired one, is the identifying of a certain procedure that must be followed to ascertain either preliminary or conclusive results in a particular field of study or the completion of tasks in daily living. Method, once again, thought of in a traditional manner, is an abstracted form that can be thought of devoid of any practitioner to meet uh, foreseen intended needs. However, the observation of rhetoric's perverted use, the production, of an, uh, production and persuasion of falsity, while still meeting the qual qualifier of success in deliberative rhetoric, for example, i.e. persuasion, thus illustrates something extra methodological in its components. Where traditional notions of methodology envision the model devoid of any human practitioner as constitutive to its overarching structure, the practice of rhetorical style is dependent on three seemingly external factors, which are thus assumed into the larger systems of operations. These deponents are captured in the Greek triad of ethos, logos, and pathos. The, in the initial triad, deliberative, epideictic, and judicial, represent the three forms of contextualized rhetoric whereby specific methods are implemented to meet the respective needs of their form. The latter triad of ethos, logos, and pathos speak to one, the credibility of the speaker, two, the truth of the content spoken, and three, the audience who receive what has been spoken. This triad is found within Isocrates' previous three contexts of public speech, yet signify as external variables to rhetorical methodology. For rhetoric, as Isocrates suggests, to communicate truth, it must appeal to at least one of these three external terms of ethos, logos, or pathos. Yet we can also identify the persuasiveness of falsity when one of these external forces are appealed by means of the speaker. It is this very tension between truth and falsity in rhetorical form that haunts Plato in his many dialogues. Plato ponders if rhetoric can be, if rhetoric can be used for the presentation of lies, 
than does it have any intimate relationship to truth, the subject of philosophy, I, I might say. How is truth concerned, uh, discerned, excuse me, and then presented in public discourse? If lies can be presented as equal to the tru truth and even made persuasive to the masses, what then validates it? For Plato, the privileging of ethos, as in the credibility of the one speaking, is a method whereby authority can be established and the truth properly presented. For the purposes of this presentation, I'll be jumping relatively quickly to the conclusion and circumventing a lot that could be illustrated uh, through studying several of Plato's dialogues. Instead, I want to focus on the character of Plato's Socrates, last speech in the Phaedrus. In the Phaedrus, Plato raises three distinct implicit questions. One, is love good or bad on behalf of the beloved? Two, whether rhetoric is a good or bad art slash practice? And three, whether privilege should be given to the orated or written text? We'll be primarily addressing the third question in this presentation. The Phaedrus illustrates a deeply insightful methodological reflection that remains implicit in the dialogue between the characters of Socrates and Phaedrus. The implicit theme to the dialogue asks whether rhetoric is persuasive to the audience because of the validated logos that is known to be true or because the rhetor's exploitation of their ethos upon the audience. Throughout the course of the dialogue, Socrates instructs the young Phaedrus that the logos of philosophy is a privileged content and how we should direct our speech. Rhetoric as a skill must be for the presentation of true logos and not continue as an act of mere flattery or deception. While the logos is to be understood as the truth of the text, Plato recognizes that the truth does not seem to speak for itself. It requires to be adequately presented in order to be persuasive. The last speech is Socrates' expression of the proper use of rhetoric as it attempts to communicate the truth, i.e. the logos, while also appealing to the audio audience's social imaginary. This is uh, done by Phaedrus' knowledge of Greek mythology, i.e. his pathos. In the establishment of a, a privileged position of authority, the ethos of Socrates. The gods are appealed to both to both discern the hidden truth of reality and to establish Socrates as a divinely inspired and authoritative orator. Quote, I attribute to the local deities and perhaps the prophets of the muses who are sinning over our heads may have imparted their inspiration onto me. And that's a quote from the character of Socrates. To not fall short of truth once again, like in the other speeches found in this dialogue, Socrates grounds his arguments in the movements of the gods where we find ourselves in the grander scheme of the cosmos. The larger cosmological picture set up through rhetorical dialogue is to impart an insight upon Phaedrus and the reader that we cannot truly know thyself without understanding ourselves within the larger cosmological play. If we heed Socrates' instructions at the beginning of the dialogue and allegorically interpret myth, it reveals the beauty of the cosmos and our participation within this beauty, which thus inspires our, uh, inspire our eyes to potentially unveil the truth and our ascension to the forms through beauty. What may come across as an odd shift to mythic imagination for Socrates reveals a deep existential reality that Plato holds throughout his corpus. It also presents Socrates as a speaker of truth. In order to, uh, for Phaedrus to come to see the hidden aspects of reality, the logos, it requires the authority of Socrates' persuasion to make things utterly apparent in a manner of praesia. This is not to argue that ethos undermines an appeal to pathos in Plato's rendering of the matter. Rhetoric, when rightly ordered, is not for the promotion of the individual in the act of speaking, but for the guidance of the one who is listening towards the, tr the truth. Yet this guidance is only made possible and is successful in the ability to make logos persuasive to the listener. And for Plato, this is ultimately established in the credibility and authority of the orator, i.e. ethos, like I've been mentioning. Our natural desire, the aphrodisia of our opinions to be oriented towards the best or the good, can be allegorically referred to in rhetoric as a type of medicine. For rhetoric is a medicine to the soul for, quote, it implants the conviction or virtue which you desire by the right application of words and training, end quote. Rhetoric, hence, must be first underpinned by knowledge and definitions of what it seeks to discuss. But this knowledge is then presented and only made ultimately persuasive by the authority of the one who hath spoken. So I'll move now on to Augustine's rhetorical perspective as a kind of demonstration of the alteration. Augustine, in the opening line to his book, 
uh, to book one of De Doctrina Christiana, writes, quote, there are two things on which all interpretation of scripture depends, the process of discovering what we learn, modus invendi, and the process of presenting what we have learned, modus preferendi, end quote. While Augustine was steeped in the tradition of Greek and Roman rhetoric and taught traditional forms of rhetoric before his conversion, he nevertheless represents a distinct opinion on the authority of truth that arises out of a text in comparison to Plato. Where Plato, as we have just mentioned, but I'll reiterate for clarity purposes, argued for the privileging of an orator's ethos as a method to establishing textual authority and thus presenting the truth, Augustine seemingly represents a transition in Western culture where the pathos of the receptive body, either an individual or community, is where authority thus originates. When speaking about the incarnation, for example, Augustine writes, quote, this is a little bit of a lengthier quote. So in the wisdom of God, the world was incapable of rec recognizing God through wisdom. What then, since he, was all, since he was here already, was the reason for his coming, if not that it pleased God to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching? And what was the manner of his coming, if not this? The word was made flesh and lived among us. When we speak, the word which we hold in our mind becomes a sound in order that we have in our mind may pass through ears of flesh to the listener's mind. This is called speech. Our thought, however, is not converted into the same sound, but remains intact in its own home, suffering no diminution from its change as it takes on the form of a word in order to make its way into the ears. In the same way, the word of God became flesh in order to live in us, but was unchanged, end quote. Truth is available for discovery, according to Augustine, in the presentation of the logos by the will of the rhetor or speaker. Yet this presentation must meet the audience in their own ways of life while ultimately remaining unchanged, metaphorically emulating Christ's condescension on taking on flesh. Emulation becomes a great importance for Augustine and the later medieval tradition in teaching and, and the development of rhetorical style. As James J. Murphy writes, quote, he, being Augustine, says at one point that rhetoric should not be studied by older people, unable to do the drill or imitative work, which is so easy for the young. Again, this is a, for Augustine, a, a, a interesting example here, and sometimes not entirely true. Rather than ascribing to either Isocrates' theory that individuals were either innately born with the talent for rhetoric or the instruction of rhetorical education through the use of textbooks, Augustine argues that the attempt to emulate great rhetoricians is one's first way to learning. Emulation becomes in Augustine's rhetorical theory the first principle for both the purposes of pedagogy and the, uh, theoretical reflection uh, on the methods of persuasion. To use Murphy's term, emulation becomes a defining principle of Augustine's meta-rhetoric. Murphy coins the term meta-rhetoric to signify a similar sort of reflection as what epistemology is to our acquisition of knowledge. Meta-rhetoric, describes Murphy, is a quote, is the counterpart of epistemology. Meta-rhetoric investigates what a rhetorician needs to know in order to be a rhetorician. It examines first principles, either stated or left implicit, upon what a rhetor rhetorician bases his whole activity, end quote. For Augustine, the development of a rhetor through emulation is not purely limited to the student's ability to imitate Meta-rhetorically, Christ acts as the prime rhetor by which all students should learn to emulate. During the Son's visible mission, Christ presented himself as the truth, not primarily through the establishment or established credibility, but through what Augustine defines as caritas, charity. Augustine's rhetorical emulative structure culminates in the rhetor's presentation of truth, not from an authority based by their own credibility, but through an authority established in love due to their caritas towards their audience. Augustine writes, a crowd that is eager to learn tends to show by its movements, whether it has understood. Until it, it does show this, the topic must be rolled around in a variety of different manners. This is not possible for those who deliver prepared or memorized speeches, but when it is clear it has been understood, the sermon should be brought to an end or a transition made to another topic, end quote. The love-motivated condescension of the established rhetor to the pathos of their audience is a foundational notion to Augustine's rhetoric. The rhetorician in emulating Christ's own rhetoric 
presents the truth not by way of establishing their credibility for the validity of truth's sake, but for the per but for providing clarity to the audience for the purposes of understanding. And I find this an interesting note if we maybe want to compare for those who were present to Rob Elliott's talk earlier this morning and made about joint attention. The privileging of truth's clarity rather than the validity in Augustine's rhetoric is a significant factor of why he turns, uh, why in turn he privileges pathos in the presentation of logos rather than ethos. As it was while with Plato, there can never be a true denial of any of the three aspects of ethos, logos, or path or the pathos triad for successful rhetoric to occur. However, to once again address our initial question, Augustine argues that authority and hence value of a text is only ever established if clarity of the text's truths are presented clearly and eloquently to its audience. If the truth of a text fails to be presented clearly, its audience and hence uh, would hence never understand, then, lack, then a lack of value is established, thus rendering the text obsolete and lacking any authority. Furthermore, James M. Farrell attributes Augustine's rhetorical theory as concerned with the, quote, salvation of those to whom we speak. Augustine writes, every man should be loved, uh, should be loved, be loved for the sake of God. Thus we teach, we should desire that all enjoy God with us and that all the assistance we give them or get from them should be directed toward the end, end quote. The rhetor then does not represent the deposit of truth whereby credibility must be established to validate the speech. Instead, the rhetor becomes a passive and clear presentation of the truth to the needs and exigencies of the audience. And I'll wrap up with my last section here. So the authority and textual medium. So what are we to make of Plato and Augustine's two distinct positions in rhetorical theory? For Plato, ethos was to be the privileged term for the credibility of, of a text's truth through the re, uh, reputation of the rhetor. For Augustine, a successful appeal to an audience's pathos made in charity is to be regarded as a principle for providing clarity to a text's understanding. The clarity of the text's truth then would lead to the establishment of the text's authority. Given these, these two account, th given these two accounts, what establishes the authority of scripture? Do Christians hold in faith the truths revealed in Scripture because of the perceived credibility of its, of its authors to the multiple books which constitute the Bible? Or do Christians find the Bible's authority in the reception and interpretation of the communicable truths of the divine mystery? In other words, does the Bible establish its authority through the means of appealing to its own ethos, composed of the authors and historical circumstances which gave rise to the text, or through its pathos? and the appeal to the faith-based needs of the community in which it finds itself in. If we recall Gordon, who we started with uh, his reflection at the beginning, all engagement with the textual otherness of scripture depends on the subjective constitution of the individuals or communities engaging those remarks. He seems to imply the latter. While the authors and the historical circumstances of the Bible establish much of the textual text authority, ultimately the Bible maintains its universal authority through time and space in its clear reception to the pathos of the community. The Bible is rhetorically persuasive due to the modus preferendi of the rhetor who presents the truths of scripture in an act of charity. Are we then to conclude that Plato is wrong and that his ethos-based assessment of rhetor uh, rhetoric's uh, efficacy is inherently flawed? Does textual authority based on a theory that privileges the communication of logos through ethos rather than pathos become obsolete in the light of a community's faith towards the communability of a text's truths. Rather, I wish just to su suggest that the transition in rhetorical thought between Plato and Augustine does not arise out of a dialectical contradiction. Instead, the transvaluation of an ethos to a pathos-based rhetorical theory is a result of the differing mediums for which the two authors are contemplating. Plato's rhetorical theory was produced in a culture steeped in oral tradition, which favored the presentation of logos in its oratory form. The, the event in which the text, or the text in the broadest sense, uh, uh, an or, orated text, uh, was facilitated, um, was orated, facilitated both the presentation of logos and its possible persuasion over an audience. The oral text required the credibility of the speaker to be intact for the reception of the logos to be considered valid and thus authoritative. As the or orator knew the audience for which he was to speak to, the text could be preemptively contextualized to appeal to the pathos of the audience. Hence, the hallmark of oral rhetoric uh, 
is the credibility of the author and, the, and their historical situatedness. What Paul de Kerr exemplifies, however, in the transition to the written word is that, quote, this inscription substituted for the immediate vocal, physiognomic, or gestural expression leads to the disappearance of the human character. In the written word, the specified spatiality of a text is dislodged from its situatedness in the removal of its anchor, the human voice, and is then fixated in the realm of limitless temporality. Quote, because the event appears and disappears, suggests the occur, there is a problem of fixation and inscription, end quote. The written text can no longer rely on the authority of the speaker who presents its logos and must appeal to another condition in order to be considered valuable to the masses. The text not by its own initiative, but by the reader of the written word, thus controls the authority as to whether the whether contextualize the logos of their texts to their own particularized pathos. Ecker identifies two symmet uh, symmetrical changes which occur in the fixation of a text from their oral to written form. Quote, the relation between message and speaker at one end and the communication chain and the relation between message and hearer at the other are together deeply transformed when the face-to-face -face relation is replaced by the more complex relation of reading to writing, resulting from the direct inscription of discourse and letter, end quote. In oral text, the, mean, the meaning is designated by, human, by the human speaker who ascribes emphasis and who presents logos in a manner that brings about its validity. Oral texts allow, quote, the ability of discourse to refer back to the speaking subject and presents a character of immediacy because the speaker belongs to the situation of interlocution. He is there in the genuine sense of being there, of Dasein, end quote. So that, that's what occur. This results in the overlapping of the rector's intention, intentionality and the text's meaning. Thus, it is the same thing to understand what the speaker means and what the discourse means. And this is my last page. Bear with me. Written text, as it is the process of fixating the text out of its initial historical spatiality and towards a universalizing temporality, serves the context between the rhetor's intention and the meaning of the text. Quote, the disassociation of the verbal meaning of the text and the mental intention of the author, argues occur, gives to the concept of inscription its decisive significance beyond the mere fixation of previous oral discourse, end quote. The written text thus no longer maintains authority through the rhetor's intentionality, but instead upon the contextualizing capability of the receptive community. The inscribed word disassociated from its original vocalized discourse becomes vulnerable and in fear of being all but forgotten. Charity on behalf of both the rhetor and who, who expounds upon the meaning of a written text and charity on behalf of the listen, listening audience is the principle that must be maintained. The answer then as to where the Bible maintains its textual authority is ultimately determined by the form for which the logos is embedded. Given its inscribed medium that we know, the Bible thus maintains its authority across time in its continual reception by charitable communities. The phrase, what the Bible says, thus is answerable not through the arbitrary appeal to the original author, for the written word has become disassociated from the ethos of their intentionality, but through the individual or community's charitable reading of the text, meaning, and the relationship. It has with the, the cultural and historical contingencies of their own time. It is at this point where Doran would complement this train of thought quite fantastically. Where this, where this research plans to continue is to see how rhetorical theory, which has, has here attempted to evaluate authority and textual analysis, can provide further elucidation to Dorn's work in Trinitarian theology. The gift of the spirit and the form of sanctifying grace produces the habit of charity we have been engaging uh, with when reading texts. Therefore, the vulnerability of the spoken word disconnected but not forgotten by the initial speaker breathe upon us the conditions for elevation, which in turn pour our hearts in the communal love that births all form of charity. Thank you very much. All right. Um, anyone with a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Thank you. I see Richard's hand. Go ahead, Richard. OK, um, first of all, well, since nobody else put up their hand, I'll venture in. Um, I, I uh, 
I'm fascinated with the with the the the, the line of thought here. It's not one that uh, I have heard before, and um, I, I I think I think I was able to follow most of it, um, and. Um, let me just check with you to see if I got the conclusion right. It seems to me what you're saying is that in the Bible, as we have it today, as a written word of God, the key element is the receptor in those who receive that word. Right? That's right, yeah. And And that differs from a whole long history of the church turning to the inspiration of the original author, which has quite a different history. And um, you ground you ground your conclusion, I think, uh, in an option for Augustine. Okay, who's who's a pretty authoritative figure, I would say. <laughs> um, but um, it, it 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 it's a it's a fascinating um, application of I think Lonergan's um, effort to try and help teachers understand that uh, when they're teaching they need to be able to con- to to connect and to to reach the questions of the students because if it if they don't um, pay attention to the questions of the students truth will never get communicated am, am i am i sort of in the ballpark here that that yeah, they were you're well within the ballpark there, and that's kind of a a underlying in, intuition to the paper. Um, an entire text that I I don't uh, bring up due to already. I'm sure the organizers are furious with me because I've gone over the 20 minute mark. Um, but is Augustine's De Magistro uh, on t- on the teacher and the notion of emulation of Christ is even further posited here. And it's not in a sense that, oh, because Christ has all this authority, um, we should listen. And obviously, there's an element of that there, obviously. And that's in the same way I'm presenting that the triad, if you preference one, it doesn't get rid of the other two. Uh, But the kind of privileged position is that in an act of charity, as Christ has made himself vulnerable uh, in our human form, so too does teaching and so too does the words we express. Uh, and the way to enter into dialogue and to receive meaning and, and proper interpretation is always in an act of charity, uh, is kind of the push. It's, it's, it's remarkable that you refer to De Magistro because, as I recall, that was the very first text that I ever looked at when I started studying philosophy. Not so, a bad text to start with. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Anyway... Thank you for this. It will give me food for thought for some time. Um, Yeah, I I could go on and on, but I I think I'll stop there and let somebody else chime in. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. Patrick, I want to assure you that the organizers are not furious with you. We're always happy to um, to listen to these (laughs) Lonerganian ideas get parsed. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move to the question from Henry. Hi, thank you. thank you so much. Um, I'm not as well versed in the uh, Catholic texts beyond Lonergan. Um, and what I'm trying to get out of your, your discussion is that, uh, as the previous questioner asked, um, we seem to get distinct separate truths if the truths are dependent on the audiences and their perspectives. That's what I'm taking from it. And I think when you get those, distinct separate truths, it makes it difficult to say that there's an objective universal truth that we have come to. And I think that gives us an opportunity to synthesize those distinct separate truths that the different audiences have. And I think 
having those distinct separate truths contributes to the social surd that Lonergan talks about. And I'm wondering if you've contemplated what are some good techniques to resolve those distinct separate truths to help us get to the objective universal truth that I think we all seek. And I just throw it out on a secular basis, some opportunities to discuss that. One is utilitarianism as advocated in the book, Moral Tribes. And the other one is John Rawls' uh, theory of justice. And I'm done with my discussion. It's a great question, and uh, I think you pick up on the exact nuance here that, uh, and I knew a, a Lonergan-based uh, audience would would understand that, that in the privileging of a pathos here of the reception of a community, it's not for the relativizing of truth, that there's an element that we're, I'm dismantling notions of doctrinal universality and um, that because I'm, I'm taking down a credibility of the initial speaker, it's that the recognition um, that these universal truths are spoken in a way that bring about a privilege of pathos for clarity's own sake, that these universal truths are understand um, as means of a potential way for um, resolution of what could seem as dialectically opposed or to use um, Doran's own word, contraries rather than contradictions. Um, that is something I, I would need much more time to expound on. A lot of what's hopefully going to go into my dissertation is exactly that question. How do we create new narratives um, of historical uh, narration that don't just synthesize, but also in some form sublate and elevate um, dialectically, what seem like dialect dialectically opposed narrations? Um, so as it's been mentioned a few times, and uh, we just saw a, a brief uh, talk or mention from actually my supervisor, Gordon Rickson, this morning, uh, the, the situation in, in Canada right now, here in Toronto and throughout Canada, of the revelation and discovery of the uh, cultural genocide that's happened here. How do we reconcile uh, two forms of historical narration, one that kind of praises the innovations of colonialism, uh, that have brought about the modern state of Canada and the other narrative that recognizes the immense hor horrible circumstances and horrible actions that were perpetrated uh, by those same members that are uh, deified in the other narration. It's not a process of tearing one down and supplanting it with the other. It's a process like you're mentioning, Henry, of either synthesizing or sublating. Um, how to go about that is a very difficult process that I think establish that requires a immense um, element of reflection and recall in memory. That's why I found Cecile's talk prior to me just before our break. While I didn't get into exactly um, the questions I particularly relate to, and I'm not saying that's a that's a fault on her. <laughs> that would be selfish of me. Her questions of how a psychological analogy uh, bring about mindfulness are incredibly important when we're trying to grapple with these authoritative re uh, narr narratives that bring about our values and our meanings. So I hope that somewhat answers, Henry. Uh, I'm sure I kind of pivoted around, um, you know, being inspired maybe by a deliberative form of rhetoric like politicians and not actually answering. Um, but I hope I got to the heart of it at least. You did, thank you so much. And I just wanted to make one comment as sort of a suggestion for future topics for people to contemplate when they're writing their academic papers. Uh, in my mind, there's a big disconnect in our judicial uh, proceedings in the United States. I know you're Canadian, so you may not relate to this, um, where we have this group of conservative judicial members who talk about originalism. And when I look at originalism in the context of Lonergan, you're specifically eliminating much information and much in terms of new, better analytical frameworks from discourse in our legal proceedings. I think it's a, a topic ripe for discussion from somebody who's well-versed in Lonergan. Thank you very much for your time. Henry, I, I, I'm so happy you brought that up because a major part of the paper that was cut was I have a major uh, kind of elucidation of Mary Carruthers' introduction to her book on memory. And she tackles this exact question. She calls them fundamentalists versus textualists, uh, but she kind of con concretizes it in American judicial originalists uh, versus I forget what uh, what term you Americans would use as the kind of analogate to textualists. Um, but it, it's exactly this. How do we come about 
um, interpreting text in a lived recalled narrative. And, and no, thank you. I, I really appreciate your comments. OK, with that, I think we will um, wrap up this presentation. We want to thank you so much, Patrick, for um, taking us on this journey and um, talking us through these really, really interesting questions.